Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you. Welcome to UCL and welcome to UCL IADIR. And I am Bayez Ahmed, a lecturer at IADIR, and I am coordinating the module IADIR 0015. And just one thing, just remember the name of the department is very difficult. At the beginning, Institute for Risk and disaster reduction. And before I start the module, I just want to give an overview about me. So, so I'm starting because it's already 20 minutes of 11. So, uh, I got a PhD in disaster risk reduction from this institute. It's been two years. Before that, I studied GIS and remote sensing, uh, funded by the European Commission in three different countries. Probably some of you know about Erasmus Mundus Scholarship. And I got my bachelor in urban planning from Bangladesh. So I have a experience mixed of urban planning, geoinformatics, and risk assessment. So I do publish a lot, and that's my kind of hobby, and some spaces probably, and also I work in a number of projects. Right now I'm working in these two projects. Here about conflict and migration and how it impacts uh, the disaster scenario. So I'm from Bangladesh, just to let you know about this country a little bit. So surrounded by Myanmar here, and all three sides, India, you can see, and Nepal is just in the north. Uh, I use some examples from Bangladesh, so probably you should know about this country. And two years back, from this town, Mongdo, uh, near about one million refugees came to Bangladesh in this part, Cox's Bazaar. So I will also use some examples. Can you hear me clearly, everyone? So it's all about me in, in brief. So now, uh, that's the first lecture of this module. It has two aims to help you understand what is disaster risk reduction, and secondly, we will introduce a number of methods both qualitative and quantitative, to help you understand how data set methods, all this integrate, and you get the overall idea about disaster risk reduction. In short, we say it DRR. Okay? And also, the name of the module is Integrating Science into Risk and Disaster Reduction. And if you go to the modal page, you will see all the information is here. Just to give you a brief, this module was designed by Joanna, one of our associate professors. She is now on maternity leave, but I am now coordinating the module, okay? And it has 10 lectures. If you, uh, this screenshot is also uploaded. You will see me only today for two hours, and there are many other guest lecturers specializing on different topics. All the topics are mentioned here. Please check your timetable. The room is here. Like it is mentioned, all the class will be held here from first part 11 to 13, and second is from 2 to 4 p.m. A number of topics combining quantitative risk assessment like catastrophe modeling, how the insurance sector works. Also, there will be some introductions on climate change, insurance, integrated risk assessment, Delphi method and HPR, qualitative risk assessment methods, and some other practicals followed by an example 
But most importantly, you have an assessment on 3rd of Feb December, isn't it? So that's 20% of your total module mark. It would be group presentations, and I will introduce the topic and everything about the presentation <coughs> on 29th of October, okay, in lecture five. So that's the brief skeleton of the module. And I'm your, I'm just coordinating the module, okay? For any questions, anything, any queries, problems, <coughs> just email me, okay? And I'm based in room 34, just opposite to your master's study, <coughs> okay? So do please not, uh, room 34. Uh, it's the IRD, uh, the second floor, south wing. But it's better you just email me. And you will have other guest lecturers. You can email them for their specific topics and queries. So that's it. That's about the module. But today, I have my personal objectives. Okay, that's the module objectives. You have your own aim and objectives. Uh, because okay, uh, it is very important to understand. Because uh, okay, uh, before that. Mm, I want to do a short survey about you, Rana, because you a little bit know about me. For that, I just do a survey on wisdom. So, I will try to finish my lecture by one today. No need to enter your name, any of your personal information. If you can just go to this website and yeah, please use that code and let me know you have entered. Thirty-nine. I will wait thirty seconds more. Anyone missing or don't have any device? Okay, I think. Should I wait a few seconds more? No. Now, so I am greater than 10 years. So this is my 11th year running. Okay? And you can see most, what we call, like the students here are, I just write it down for my reference. Zero to two is 72%. Then 10 is 6%. That is with volunteer. You can understand, I mean, most of our students here, I mean, have, I mean, don't have extensive experience. I don't know, probably your field of expertise is different. Some are coming from architecture background. I don't know, from Tripoli, someone is here. Okay, the next question is, can you just uh, tick true or false? 
I mean, whether this statement is true or false. Okay, this is an, a statement. Let's see. Who says what? One more. So there is nothing called a natural disaster. How many agree? What happened to the other students? I should have another option. Like confused. Okay. Uh, true stage. Thirty-nine percent. Okay. One person say. They believe in natural disasters, okay? Uh, more than half of the class. Okay, that's all right. I will come back to it later. Thank you. So we have this less than 30, 30 minutes time. <coughs> now, the serving is done. Uh, throughout, I mean, you will, and the remaining 80% would be written exam, isn't it? Uh, for this module. And these are some of the, I mean, I mean, some parts of the questions from last year. And you can see, we <coughs> introduced a number of methods, concepts, ideas, and let's say, what is cat modeling, catastrophic modeling. And they would ask you, can you uh, contextualize this model in terms of disaster risk reduction? Or, you know, like they use this kind of things a lot. I mean, there is no straightforward, and no one will ask you, can you define what is a hazard? Okay, but they will ask you to give examples to connect any particular method or theories in the broader conceptual framework, like within DRR, how it interacts with hazard, vulnerability, resilience, and many other things. It's not only for this module, for all your upcoming modules, exams, everywhere, they will ask you, can you define it within this framework? So it is very important to understand what is DRA, what is hazard, vulnerability, and exposure, okay? And my today's aim is to help you to understand it. At the end, there would be another quiz I will have 10 questions. If you can answer all of them correctly, I would consider my lecture as a success, okay? And of course, I'm going to fail, but uh, can you hear me now, uh, everyone? <coughs> Sorry, I mean, this classroom is weird. Uh, I have to look in this side, that side, the middle. Okay, so now, uh, at the beginning, we should understand why we are here. I mean, why study disaster science, isn't it? From different backgrounds, different countries. You see, in, in the last <coughs> 20 years, this number of major disaster e events have been recorded. I am saying major. I mean, very big events. Uh, there are a lot. Mostly dominated by what? Flooding, you see? Storm includes hurricane, typhoon, whatever you name it, cyclone, and followed by you have earthquakes. I mean, this is the number of disaster events. And the events have impacted so many people globally. How many people? Now we have like seven billion. But you see, 
only flooding affected 2 billion people in the last two, 20 years. This is how, uh, almost, and if you combine everything, like the next is drought, 1.5 billion people are being impacted, and many other hazards. I mean, you see, like, the number of events doesn't mean the impact is different. You see, like, the hazard types has been changed, and death. How many people have died from major disaster events? I have, they have been considered the minor ones or the smaller ones. Only because of earthquake, this um, number of people were killed in the last 20 years. So disasters have impacted communities, societies, countries, and many were killed, injured, and all these things happened. So earthquake was third here in terms of the number of events, only 563, but it killed most number of people. <coughs> so for each disaster, the impact on community is different, okay? That is very clear. And also, if you see the global maps, the red means highly impacted. So mostly, disasters impact I mean, the developing, least developed, uh, most countries from Asia, you can see some in Haiti and other countries. So there is a link between poverty and disaster, isn't it? But that is not true. And also, you see, we always talk about, this is displacement, how many people displaced because of disaster and conflict. We always talk about war, conflict, migrants, refugees, you know, like closing the borders, what should we do, changing the immigration policy, but you see, like, more people are displaced because of disaster means, like, uh, except conflict and violence. Uh, more people are displaced because of disaster. I mean, those who believe in natural disasters, I'm talking about natural disasters, and not conflict. So it is very important. We don't talk about too much about disaster. And this is the impact from, uh, only in this year, until the first half of 2019, how many? Total 10 million people were displaced. And out of them, 7 million because of disasters, and 3.7 million because of conflict, only in six months of this year. So you see the impact is really, and mostly in the, again, Asian countries, Africa here, some in South America, very few in the United States, and almost nothing, very few in Europe. So, yes, so is that considered internal displacement or cross it, uh, This is internal displacement, good question, because so this internal displacement oh. monitoring. Sorry, yeah, it's, I'm not talking about refugees. Uh, just displacement, good question. So any question, just raise your hand if you don't understand or further clarification is required. That's why, so you see like, for any disaster event, the impact is so huge from global to local. Uh, it is important to study disaster signs and probably that's why some of you are here to know more about hazards, different methods and how. And this is one of the modules that will help you to understand the broader framework how it works, how to quantify, how to assess, all these different things. Okay, clear? <coughs> Until now everything is clear? I hope so. Okay. So I will start with these three different terminologies. So, um, this is the map of a study area. Hazard, exposure, 
vulnerability. These are the three, I mean, the pulse of disaster risk reduction. You must have to understand these three words properly and their difference, okay? They are distinct because you can see this map is for the same area. <coughs> I mean, red is very high hazardous area, medium to low. Four categories are here. For the same area, three things are different. So now we will go through it and try to understand, I mean, what do they mean and why they are different. And if you combine these three things, you get risk map, okay? This is cyclone risk map of Cox's Bazar district. If you remember the map of Bangladesh. And the hazard, exposure, vulnerability combines to what? So this is the equation you should all follow, okay? Now, yeah. so risk is the product of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. If we can just eliminate or make something zero, like if I make it zero, no hazard, so there is no risk, no vulnerability, no risk. To make something at risk, you need all the three components, okay? If one is missing, there is no risk. Clear? Mm -hmm. So sometimes we say, ah, I am at risk of, you know, something. But what does it mean by risk? Sometimes you, you don't, I mean, you are not at risk, but you think. Okay, great. So now I will go through one by one all these three different components. Later I will try to integrate. I will introduce the broader DRR framework and in oh, I need a clock. Okay, ten minutes. So I start with hazard, okay? Tomorrow there is a specific module on hazard, isn't it? Tomorrow you have a new module on anthropogenic and Oh, perfect. Okay. So they will talk more about hazard. But of course, you should know a little bit from me. What is a hazard? Three things. It can be a process, it can be a phenomenon, or human activity. That has the potential to, you know, do what? Loss of life, injury, many other things. Economic and environmental destruction. Okay? And broadly, there are three types of hazards. So, like, any phenomenon that can do any harm to, so I will mostly today, because I am not human, I mean, so let me go through uh, three types of hazards, okay? Natural. This is one village in the southern Bangladesh. Back in 2007, it was completely destroyed by a cyclone. Okay, you see the uh, 3,500 people were killed in that region. So this is coming from cyclones, striking a coastal community, destroying, killing people, destroying livelihood means agricultural activities, all other things. Okay, this is purely, the hazard is natural. Okay, clear? Anthropogenic, it means related to, purely related to human activity, okay? This is the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Because of that, almost 100 people were killed. 
and near about quarter million people were forced to evacuate surrounding the no exclusion zone, okay? Uh, this is purely nothing related to nature, purely human. And there are many other examples like we all know about terrorism, conflict, war, all these things are anthropogenic. So I am now giving an example of socio-natural hazard. How in nature, uh, the society or people come and make it vulnerable, okay? So if you remember that map from me, so a million Rohingya refugees, they had a specific name, came to the Cox Bazar district. You remember that map? So they are coming, and the area was like this, the district was <coughs> covered by forest and green, okay? And there are hills, hilly areas. You see, this is the first week of uh, the influx. People started building tents, still green, okay? So people are start, there was no threats of landslides, okay, in this area. But suddenly a million people came and they started cutting the bamboo and all other trees, cutting the hills to do what? To build their tents. It's a million people. The density is so high. I mean, in one tent, eight or 10 people are living. It's like a nightmare. It's been two years. You remember the year when they started coming? August 2017. And this is a photograph taken in July this year. They are having now landslides, flash flooding, one bridge was destroyed, some houses, and some people were killed. So this is one example of what? Social, natural. I mean, the environment was <coughs> natural. Suddenly something happened within society, a conflict, forced them to leave their place in Myanmar, come to another place, and they are facing all these disasters. So three broad types. Very important. We cannot prevent any hazard completely or fully, we have to remember forever in our mind. It is impossible, you know, like people living on hills, you cannot avoid landslides. People living in the coastal areas, you cannot avoid hurricanes or cyclones. Sometimes you might ask, like, why people are living in coast? Who told them to go and live on those hills or coast? Because not all the people are so fortunate like us, okay? We made it, we are in a very safe place. But many, billions of people are forced to live in all those hazard-prone areas. Billions, okay? But what can we do? We can reduce <coughs> the hazard impact. One example is like, we can have early warning systems for cyclone or tornadoes and we can evacuate that place, you know, a few days before. Cyclone is coming, it saves life. One good example is in the same coastal area back in Bangladesh, back in 1970s, more than quarter million people were killed. So now within the past 50 years, we have very strong, cyclone preparedness program, and the uh, image, you remember, only killed 3,500. We have reduced a lot from like a quarter million. We had one more zero here. We don't have it. In 50 years, that's the progress. We have now good early warning systems. We have cyclone shelters, like thousands. We have built it so that people can leave their communities on the coast and take shelter 
and save their lives. So that's one uh, impact of early warning system. Great. That's about. That's all about hazard. Ten minutes. Okay, and then eight minutes. <coughs> Is it clear to you what is a hazard? If we ask you what is a hazard, you don't need to memorize it. Okay? I never memorize anything. Many, if I ask, they will just, yeah. But you know, it's a, it can be a process, it can be a phenomenon, you ca it can be a human activity that can cause loss of life, injure people, loss of economy, infrastructure, many things, okay? So that's hazard, no need to memorize. Okay, great. So now I go to, clear everyone? Just one quick question. Uh, yes. Um, is the same thing for you hazard than threat? These are like synonyms. People use threat, hazard, but here officially we call it hazard, okay? I mean, hazard itself is a threat, isn't it? Threat to anything, anyone, economy or infrastructure. Okay. We have one more hour. Okay, now. Let's talk about exposure, okay? What is this? It's a situation. Two things you have to remember. It's a situation and the events should be tangible. Isn't it? Tangible means what? You can count, you can quantify. And there is another thing, intangible. You cannot quantify. Two examples of tangible, like there are 39 students in this class. That's quite tangible. Intangible means your belief. Like someone can say, I don't believe in natural disasters. I mean, or many, your past, your many other things, like your culture the way you dress up, many other things, intangible things. We cannot change it or quantify it. It's very difficult. So a situation, an intangible assets located in hazard prone area. So like in the hazard section, what we did, we prepared a hazard map, you remember? Red is very high hazardous to green is no hazard, okay, in between. If you have like 100 people in low hazard area, I mean, there is no probability of a disaster to occur. But if you have like 100 people in high hazard area, that's a risk, okay? That contributes to risk. So very simple. Number of people, number of buildings, houses, properties, any other things located in hazard from areas. <coughs> yeah, let me say number of people, types of assets, purely tangible and physical things that I say. So, but exposure has two basic characteristics. One is time and one is place, okay? It changes over time. Can you remember, can you give one example? So like the Rohingya situation. Uh, yes, great. With time? <coughs> The exposure has changed. There was no people in those hills. It was green. In just four months, one million people just came on the hill, started cutting the trees, cutting the hills, and 
over time the exposure has changed from 0 to 1 million, right? Time, very important. In a high-rise building, so now you will not answer. In a residential building, at night, of course, there it will be full of people, isn't it? At two at night, the whole building would be occupied by, let's say, like 200 people. If a fire breaks out in that building, in a residential building, that's exposure for a given time <coughs> and in a given type of building. <coughs> but in a commercial building, like in this room now, fire breaks out, that's exposure. But at 2 at night here, if a <coughs> fire breaks out, no, because there will be no one at 2 a.m., isn't it? So over time, it's very dynamic. Same room can be exposed within a time, within a place as well. In the same earthquakes hitting at different times. At daytime, there would be like less casualties at night time because residential buildings are not, I mean, the commercial buildings or all other buildings where mass people go are built in a different way. Like retail buildings, of course, designed to accommodate like 10,000 students. But in a residential building designed to accommodate like 200 people. So uh, it's different. And same this example given by one of our students. Uh, I mean, previous disaster, it means the conflict can force people to leave their lands and move to somewhere in an unsafe place, isn't it? So conflict and war force them to come to Cox's Bazaar that is not safe for them anymore. So no safe place for those one million people. Back home, they would be shot dead. Back in Bangladesh, they are dying. Okay. Clear? Another good example. Back in 2013, in October, a super typhoon went through somewhere, there was no <coughs> impact. But just one month after a similar type of typhoon killed 6,300 people. Why? Because this image. The first one is Lakima, the same strength, went through Nova. Doesn't matter, no, no expo. I mean, no one was exposed. But just after a month, <coughs> it went through Philippines, killed 6,300 people. So this is what? An example of space. So time and space is important for exposure. Yes, please. Depends on what what is your priority. I mean, millions of people uh, or one army base, 100 soldiers, or you have your missiles or all the things. So it all is a choice. I will talk about it. Disaster <coughs> is a choice. Okay. Why? So it's up to you. 
I think there was no casualties and no, I mean, when we call disaster, it has to be like very big in scale, catastrophic, you know. I mean, one people with due respect injured, that's not disaster, I mean, it has to be catastrophic. But that's a disaster, a small scale disaster. I come back to it later. Yes, yes please. Yes, yes. If you take, for instance, uh, the current fire burning in the Amazon, that there's very few people in the Amazon who've actually been killed, but you, the, the scale of that is still an incident. Yes, that's, that's destroying forests. I already, in the hazard definition, it's already written loss to, I mean, loss to environment. Of course, it can be considered. Yeah. It it doesn't have to be always people. A disaster doesn't need to kill people always or Ill injured. It can destroy a barren forest. I mean, it can just destroy economy, livelihood. I mean, like in case of drought. I mean, what is it is doing. I mean, uh, more lands are not, I mean, cultivable. You know, like people are losing more land because it cannot cultivate anymore. So it's, but it has indirect impact on the community. So yes, there was an exposure because probably, I don't know that detail, there was no one. And okay, great. So now is it clear to you what is exposure? If we tell you to define, then I hope you can answer it. It should be two things. What? Tangible asset. If you have to quantify, what was another thing? I forgot. It has to be a situation. It should have two basic things, space and time. And now you, do you remember hazard? Very bad text. This of me, not you, okay? You have to answer all ten correctly, okay? Otherwise, I would fail. <laughs> Don't do this, okay? Now I go to the third component, <coughs> most important, that answers our last student's question, okay? Vulnerability. So now we know hazard, now we know exposure, now it is vulnerability. We use the word here, there's another, to call it, for the buzzword, I don't know. Susceptibility. We always use susceptibility. What is that? The potential to do harm or influence. Whatever, very simple thing. It has to be a condition or a process that can increase the susceptibility of the likelihood to harm. It can be an individual a community, a society, a system, anything, okay, from hazard. And this is more important. Vulnerability is purely, until now we discussed about what? More physical things, you know, like hazard is more about I need to know about the characteristics of the of the cyclone, okay? What is the strength? What is the wind speed? In which direction it is going? Okay, it's pure hazard is purely about uh, the physical or natural phenomena, whatever. It's purely about one thing, and exposure is about it's about again a choice. I mean, having building, having people is not the problem. It's about the timing <coughs> and the placing, okay? If you are in the wrong time, in the wrong place, you are at, you can be exposed. 
but vulnerability is about human, purely human dimension, human choice. A condition, okay, that can harm <coughs> individual anything, okay? So you don't understand what I'm saying. <coughs> it can have six major dimensions, okay? Six, just remember six things. That can make anything vulnerable. One is physical. Some examples like if you design, so like we have, I think we have fire safety things, where is those things, alarms, uh, CCTV camera. This is part of design, isn't it? If you have evacuation, <coughs> here one, there one, you have fire alarms. So this is a design of this classroom that makes you less vulnerable to what? Fire hazards. Okay? Back in my home in Bangladesh where I studied, there was no such thing. Only classroom with bench and tables. Okay? No evacuation doors, no this thing. That makes you more vulnerable to. So that's part of, we call it physical vulnerability. Okay, clear? Everyone? Yeah. Well, no way. Social vulnerability. This is dimension number two. Some examples are there, like uh, I will bring two examples of if someone is in this classroom is well, like, uh, is, is disabled. <coughs> that person cannot move. That person needs wheelchair. Okay, if there is a, a fire alarm, everyone will move very quickly. But the problem is that disabled person. So disability is part of social vulnerability. Migrant people, I mean illegal or even legal refugees, they are always like those Rohingya people. They are always vulnerable of what? Because they are refugees, they don't have access to formal formal healthcare systems. Like if they need a surgery, like for anything, like any tumor or anything, they cannot that's very expensive. You need to go to for hospital. If they cannot. So that makes those people vulnerable. So that's why refugee population, marginalized population, poor people, if you don't have enough income, uh, winter is coming here. Many people, you'll see, uh, you'll read the news, like many people cannot afford to switch on the heating in their room, many in this country. Uh, that's very expensive per month, like 120 pounds, it will cost you more. I mean, that that is your economic vulnerability, okay? The third. Sometimes, uh, that is for developed countries, sometimes in poor countries, like if you just give them some, we call it microcredit or microinsurance, like there will be a specific lecture on microinsurance, the insurance for the poor people. I mean like they lost something, like their only source of income was like cattle rearing, like cows, I mean, they used to, I mean, that, that is like dead after any event. You just, it will cost you like 1,000 pound. If you give 1,000 pound to that person, that's called microcredit, very small amount, that can change, or that person can start their livelihood. So access to microcredit is also part of economic vulnerability. Fourth is environment, you all know about it, more or less, like poor environmental management, a uh, good example is like in Amazon, you know, like your government is being accused, I don't know if you are from Brazil, the president is being accused severely because he let the loggers in, uh, many other things, I mean, poor management of environmental planning. 
Amazon file. Climate change, I will not talk about it. Very conflicting. Elon will give a lecture on it. Yeah. Okay, two more institutional. Institutional means, I mean, good governance. Governance means a system. I mean, this is, I mean, some factors are also interlinked between each other. Like having this fire alarm in this room is also an example of good governance. Means the UCL authority really thinks about the student. I mean, safety and security. We have security camera, I can see at this room, and many other things. I mean, that's an example of good authority. So institutional decisions can create vulnerability. Same for the Amazon forest. I mean, they should protect this, what I understand, like Amazon specialized. I mean, that is all in the law of the art, isn't it? And one last thing is the cultural, cultural vulnerability. Here comes that intangible <coughs> things like your indigenous knowledge, local culture and customs, habit, many other things. I will give some examples later. And this is, I mean, we don't consider it. This is number seven. Many people bring it. Historical past can make a country are a state vulnerable, like colonization. India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh was colonized for 200 years. Uh, many other countries, like the Spanish, colonized Latin America for centuries. This, this can make communities and other things vulnerable, isn't it? War, conflict, slavery for many centuries. Okay, so there are major six dimensions. You just remember physical, social, economic, environmental, institutional, and cultural. These six things can make an individual, a community, a society, or a system vulnerable, okay? And these six things are purely related to human dimension. If the human individual people choice, okay? Clear? All clear? Back, the back row. Clear? One good example, can you tell me whether this is a fake news or not, if you read it? After 20 seconds, let me know who thinks this is a fake news. Thinks this is a fake news. Oh, just me alone. Okay. No, this is a news just from last month in CNN. And when I was reading, people used to sacrifice children like 600 years back in Latin America to get rid of the El Nino. That's, they call it disaster, natural disaster, like the 51% people say. You see, like, that's crazy stuff. I mean, what, that's one good example of culture. To make one God happy, they sacrifice 250 children so that that God becomes happy and stops El Nino. Nothing to do with 
sacrificing children after 600 years in Nori. So that's what you only know. Same goes for plagues in this country. It took them centuries to understand the rats in your room is carrying that virus or bacteria or whatever that disease. Many people still that <coughs> cultural that goes to many other things, but there are some bad examples like how culture can make you vulnerable, okay? There are good examples as well. After the great tsunami in Indonesia back in 2004, many people were killed, if you remember. Thousands and thousands, but this specific community, just a, just a small, a small island in Indonesia, uh, they call it, uh, this island, those people had some traditional understanding of tsunami, and they used like local oral stories and poems and songs, all those are written so from their previous event back in 1907. From since then, they know about tsunami, they have their local understanding, indigenous knowledge in their poems and songs and oral stories it was, it was written and they took uh, initiative and none of them were killed. And that was even more vulnerable uh, location than the mainland in Bandache in Indonesia. So that's one good example of how culture, intangible things like oral stories, poems, and songs can help you to get rid of a disaster. So two back-to-back -back examples of culture. I don't have time to think other examples. Okay, so five minutes break. All right. Um, <coughs>
Started late, so I was mute from the last class. I, I know a bit long. Yeah, it's 10 15 minutes long, yeah, and, yeah. and it was raining. That makes everyone vulnerable now. <laughs> missing I hope I'm not I should I mean skip some slides because we started late there you said it is very problem because you have to finish five minutes before there might be someone waiting if you if not you I'm not blaming you if students come late but we can discuss later okay you all know this okay just one question out of these two, family size and total people, which one is vulnerability and which one is exposure? Family size, what is this? Vulnerability. Vulnerability. Okay, great. Yes, because that's a choice of some people like earning really less, but have like, in my country, earn earns less than a dollar daily, but got like five children. You know, the family size makes them vulnerable. That's choice of, okay, I'll get, should I run it? Oh. So I have 30 minutes, isn't it? 30 minutes. Quickly, I really like to go slow and make you understand and make myself understand as well. So when you have both vulnerability and exposure, that is a serious problem. Okay? You are vulnerable and you are exposed. So we can have four combinations. This is a real problem. 
what is it a problem? You are vulnerable, but you are not exposed. Is it a problem or not? Who thinks this is a problem? No one thinks. I mean, yes, a, a poor people or someone vulnerable, but not exposed. That's not bad, because they are not exposed. Okay, you are exposed, but not vulnerable. Then what? Not so bad, again, okay? Maybe we are all exposed to fire hazard, but we are not vulnerable, because we have evacuations, fire alarm, everything ready. And who doesn't have vulnerability and not exposed? What is that? Very good. Great. So you understand exposure and vulnerability clearly. So we have three sides of risk, isn't it? So all sides are necessary. If you just take out one side, it becomes, okay. So that's why we have three types of maps because for hazard, we consider different factors. For exposure, we consider another set of factors. For vulnerability, we consider different factors. That's why these three maps are different. And if you multiply all, you get the risk map that is again different from all these three because you are multiplying. So now, is it clear? What is risk, hazard, exposure, and vulnerability? Four things, the heart of disaster risk reduction. And you must have to know how to differentiate between them. So any question, any model now people bring in front of you and tell him, can you contextualize this? within these four things. I hope you can now bring your own examples, your own ideas, and fit in within that framework, okay? All clear? You need this for next four, next one year. So that is the equation. Great, now quiz time. Go to Quickly, ah, go here. Are you still logged in? Okay, don't disappoint me, okay? <laughs> so, no need to enter your name, just Go randomly, it's a test for me, whether you understood my lecture. Everyone ready? Everyone? Or the, I mean the chosen 32, are you ready? Okay, I'm going. Cyclone intensity falls in which category? Just select. You have 30 seconds. And yeah, in total. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Five seconds. Ah. Uh, 
clone in 10 seconds. That is a hazard because it's all about the cyclone. And that cannot be vulnerable because a human cannot, I mean, define the wind speed of the cyclone. That's natural phenomenon. Great. Clear? Last two is most important, okay? So we have ten. Next, ready? Literacy rate. Fifteen seconds remaining. Literacy rate <coughs> belongs to which category? Okay, glad no one picked hazard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, literacy rate. Honest, like don't be, it's not a problem because all these different things and three different things and sometimes to be honest, let me be honest, like few things can be in both groups. Okay, it's it's how you perceive, how you are defining that specific, but some things cannot be. I mean, literacy rate should be vulnerability always because it it's a choice of the. Human, you know, like going to school or not, learning something, or the government, but the institution. I mean, they should have schools ready for children to go to school. I mean, you know, that's vulnerability. But yes, that is the good news. We are progressing. Next. Elevation, I mean, this is a topo topography, you know? Elevation. Topographic elevation. Topographic elevation. Topographic elevation. Topography of an area, okay? Topography, yes. Or elevation, like angulations. students are correct. Uh, uh, but uh, topography can never be vulnerability, to be honest. It's never ever possible. That's the phys physical characteristics of an area, isn't it? That's nothing to do with human. I mean, if you go in high mountains, I mean, that's the topography of elevation. You cannot change it. So, it has to be exposure. Hazard, can elevation bring hazard to you? No. Hazard should be like, okay, in high elevation, you can have landslide, you can have like rock fall, you can have avalanches. You understand? It can, elevation can never be a hazard. And it can never be a vulnerability. Then what's left? That's altitude sickness, and this is elevation. I haven't mentioned sickness. If I mention sickness, then it becomes vulnerability, because some people have altitude sickness. Anyhow, next. Ah. Storm surge height. Storm surge, you know, like? Waves, high waves, we call it storm because of storm, it brings high waves in coastal areas. Someone help me. <laughs> waves in the coastal areas, okay? I have already answered. Oh, 
है आई मीन स्टॉम सेल इज जस्ट वे बिकॉज ऑफ स्टॉम इट इज ब्रिंगिंग एनी वाय इज प्योरली हैजल ओके रेसिडेंशियल कॉमर्शियल इंडस्ट्रियल इट कैन बी फॉरेस्ट वाटर बॉडीज लैंड यूज ओके This is very difficult one. Have you answered it? Very difficult one. To be honest, to be honest, uh, it can be both. Uh, because I mean. I mean, honestly, it can be both. I mean, the government can decide, like land use type is this that goes to vulnerability. Sometimes, <coughs> in a specific land use type, you are already there and you are exposed, isn't it? Like uh, residential areas in dangerous slopes, you rent a house there, you are exposed to landslides. I mean, that's very good. Well done. But We have time. Two more quickly. Number of cyclone shelters in a specific area. Number of cyclone shelters. Having more cyclone shelters or having less cyclone shelters makes a difference for. Coastal communities. What is the answer? Okay, ready? Yes. So it's the same because you have cyclone threat. You should have shelters for any the. Building cyclone shelters reduce the risk, and this is the government's decision, and it goes to vulnerability. Of course, who put hazard? I don't know. A cyclone shelter can never be a hazard. Can be a hazard, but in if everything is a hazard. Okay. Okay. Last few, quick. Okay. Then I go to slides. Okay. This is the last one. population with disability i don't know really explain in explain in the class if someone is disabled what happens so having more disabled people somewhere it is linked to <coughs> of course vulnerability A very well done class. I want to end here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, before you, yeah. Uh, so, the more people with vulnerability, I mean, with the disability, makes things more vulnerable. Exposure. Okay. <laughs> so, I think now. You see, I go to my slide. Okay, quick. 15 minutes. Great. So, few things. <coughs> I already told disaster is a very com complex field and a subject. It's dynamic. changes with time and space and very context specific we use this buzzword context context means one example might not be useful for another example isn't it for another 
area. I mean, what happened back in Peru 500 years back, maybe it's not applicable for any other country. And being at risk, you remember risk is equal to thing. So being at risk and facing a disaster is not the same. Okay, you can be at risk, but doesn't mean, I mean, when some serious, so what's the definition? If serious disruption happens and the functionality of a community, society, or system because of a hazardous event force you to do all these things, different loss and impact, that's a disaster, I mean. Disaster must have to occur, you know? Like, many people live at risk in the world, but everyone is not facing disaster. Small scale, large scale, small means the communities themselves can recover, and the growing capacity, we should know this word, I mean, the resources available within you to get rid of the impact of a disaster, okay? That is called capacity. Resilience, that is very important. Um, moving forward, 10 minutes. I mean, resilience means a disaster has three phases, you know, like pre disaster during disaster and after disaster. Pre-disaster means like you have to anticipate, isn't it? Like a disaster is coming, like the cyclone is coming. During disaster means very simple, like when the cyclone strikes, what you do, your activities. I mean, pre-disaster can be cyclone shelter, you know cyclone is coming, you move to cyclone shelter. That is one example of resilience. During disaster means you need dry food, isn't it? Everything is wet, you have water up to this height, you need dry food and medicine. So you store it somewhere, that is an example of coping, I mean, capacity during disaster. And after means when the cyclone is gone, you go back to your house and the water is moved away and what? You, have, you bring back your livelihood, okay? Like what you used to do. Okay, if it is agriculture, then you need it. Uh, skipping, sorry. Is vulnerability and disaster is opposite to the same coin? Many people think resilience is the opposite of vulnerability. Okay, if you increase resilience, you decrease vulnerability. That is in one way true, but that's not exactly the same. The same event can make you vulnerable and can make you resilient as well. Can you think of it? Let's say you, you have faced a flooding disaster. Okay? Your crops are damaged, that was your livelihood, like you were a farmer, your house was partially damaged or destroyed, okay? So that flooding uh, brings vulnerability to you, okay? But now you know it also creates resilience. How? After the disaster, now you know from which direction the water is coming, okay? You can put a build an embankment in the source so that your area is now safe from flooding. So that's a learning from disaster. You were vulnerable, you went through disaster, and from that disaster you learn how to, uh, I mean, increase your capacity. Same disaster can make you vulnerable, 
and resilient. And both are not same. I use some photographs here. Like it helps you, you see, like flooding, your infrastructure, crops, health, all these problems, but it can increase resilience through social learning, like build cube oils, next time you can raise the cube oils, you can have more shelters, more livelihood options, and thus, through that disaster, you learn how to increase your capacity. Uh, this is one village, I mean, in the coastal Bangladesh, all photographs taken by me. You see, uh, after a mid-level of cyclone, water entered into the village. I mean, the same house I'm taking photograph, it was flooded up to this height. And what people did, build an embankment, you see? There is a house. Uh, the crop plants are here, the embankment is here. See, it the water is coming from this direction, but it protects the village from flooding. There was no embankment. And also, they have now more livelihood options. Like uh, uh, this lady, I met him half here. She was doing wavings and all these things. I mean, this is very simple. You take the, your machine with you in the shelter, come back, <coughs> start your livelihood activities again. You should have alternatives, not only uh, farming, you know? Also, they have raised the, this is the cube oil, if you remember push and pull it, and water comes. So they raised it, you see? The, uh, uh, the flood was um, up to this height. The toilets, they have raised it. You know, from the experience, they remember up to how, I mean, with how many centimeters the water can come, and their toilets were unusable, few wells, but now they have a new I mean, cyclone shelter, embankment is protecting, agriculture and now they have more what they are protecting their livelihoods and they are also socially integrated within themselves so all these things are examples of resilience i mean different they should have and but the same disaster it was devastated but they learned from it so We have different frameworks, very quickly. Uh, uh, we will talk a lot about Sendai framework, disaster risk reduction. It has seven goals, reduce mortality, number of affected people, reduce economic loss. This is a global uh, report that every country should you know, implement uh, these uh, goals and targets and increase, like every country should have a disaster risk reduction uh, planning by 2020. That's the target of this framework. All the countries should have international cooperation and warning systems and all other DRR things necessary. And also we have UN Sustainable Development Goals. There are seven go 17 goals. Some are linked with Sendai <coughs> framework. These two documents you should read sometime in your free time. So, I wanted to explain, but in five minutes. Very simple. This is the diagram of DRR framework. How? You have hazard and you have society here, okay? You have exposure with two dimensions, temporal and spatial. You have susceptibility, all these dimensions, if you remember. And capacity to anticipate before this disaster, during disaster is coping, and after disaster is recovering. So if you lack these three things, I mean lack of resilience, it makes you vulnerable. If you lack these three things, it makes you vulnerable. And if you are exposed over time and space, it makes you vulnerable, okay? 
the hazard interacts with society and vulnerability with exposure make puts you in or at risk. This is the diagram. And how this is hazard, vulnerability, and risk part, I have explained more or less. I could not be just out of time. These things and how to get rid of this one. You should try to increase resilience. Okay, I showed you the photographs with different activities. You should try to decrease vulnerability, I mean, different ways to address different dimensions, I mean, and you should try to reduce exposure, okay? You should know the right time, the right place. So if you can try to reduce all these things, it is called a vulnerability intervention to increase resilience, decrease vulnerability, and decrease exposure. That helps you, and hazard intervention is also important. That is what you should know. What is the intensity of the cyclone? What is the wind speed? If it is a landslide, when it occurs, like some landslides uh, are rainfall induced, only if it rains, the soil gets loose and you get landslide. You should know when, how, what is the intensity and frequency of cyclones or any hazard. You should have specific hazard intervention specific vulnerability intervention, and these two interventions combinedly called adaptation, okay? Adaptation means you can decrease vulnerability, and you can, uh, I mean, you can intervene with vulnerability to decrease it, or I mean the whole vulnerability, and you are well aware of the characteristics of the hazard, okay? That's combined called adaptation. <coughs> so you have at one side hazard, at one side you have hazard, exposure, vulnerability, lack of resilience, and risk, and other side you just address these thing, things. And this is how you see you address. This diagram works, but one thing is very important to connect between these two things. I mean, you have vulnerability, hazard, risk, and you know how to build, I mean, uplift the toilets or different interventions. Who helps you do it? That is, we call the governance, risk governance. I mean, these diagrams, you remember? That's part of implementation, planning, and cooperation from global to individual level, okay? There are levels. This is global document, uh, part of risk governance, okay? So, but you have to understand, an individual's decision can make things vulnerable or resilient. You understand? It, it goes up from individual, like me alone, from your household, like your family, your family size, you remember? Community, like within the area you live, then the local government, next scale, Different local governments make the national government system. National governments are interlinked, interlinked with different organizations, like one country is UK, one is Bangladesh, but linked with UN. Regional cooperation is important, like European Union, like you have like the Arab leagues, you have like many other different regional big collaborations, and global. So you have to remember there is another scale here you see from local scale to international scale the society <coughs> can act differently. So that's the overall DRR framework. So I hope you now understand what is hazard, what is exposure, what is vulnerability, different dimensions of vulnerability, what is resilience, before disaster, during disaster, and after disaster, how you get risk, you just multiply all these things. And if you have a good risk governance policy from international to individual level, you take adaptation policy and you just try to reduce it. 
But it, that's why we that's why we call it disaster risk reduction. Okay? And disaster is not natural what you sixty one percent say because it can be the hazard can be natural, you see? So there are aims to reduce the damage from natural hazard. But I want to say why it is not natural? Because because of only this element. This is not natural, you see? This is human. Hum completely human decision. But this too, this can be natural, this can be human, this can be natural, this can be human, but this is purely human. So if you combine all this you get risk. So it can be so no disaster can be purely natural. Okay? And that, that that's the thing. Because you have some natural component, you remember the Rohingya crisis, I mean socio natural, like there was environment and then the people came. You got disaster. And there are all if you think about any disaster you will find this. But what can you call it? You can call it uh, something from landslide, natural hazard induced disaster. You can call it landslide induced disaster, what the Rohingyas are facing. But unfortunately, many organizations are still using it because it's very difficult to say natural hazard induced disaster. They simplify <coughs> it and use it natural disaster. But that's the four ideas from my class skipping it. And always remember, hazard, your choice. <coughs> there was hazard, but doesn't matter. There was no people, but you did some land use planning, wrong land use planning. This is volcanic eruption and landslide. You put people here after your wrong urban planning, you see? And there was agricultural land. Now you put more people land here. It's a wrong choice, and you are making them risky and you face disaster. So like this diagram is important to keep always in mind. Nothing is natural. Many people say, okay, people died of, uh, I mean, volcanic eruption and landslide. That's natural disaster. But someone made a wrong mistake. I mean, a mistake here. Uh, planning to put residential areas just within a hazardous area. So I mean, that's it. Climate change is also important, one of the risk drivers, but probably in the next classes we'll understand. So my, I try to help you understand what is <coughs> risk, hazard, exposure, and vulnerability, how they interact with themselves, and what is the broader picture or the framework for DRS. And that's it. And you have a class at two. There will be a new lecture, Caroline. Anything is just remind the lecturers they have to leave before 11. And thank you for listening to me. For any complaints or anything, just email me or any help, anytime. Welcome and enjoy. Thank you.